In my research in the early church fathers, I have discovered 10 pre-tribulation rapture passages in Ephraim the Syrian, passages that I haven't seen referenced in any books, magazine or journal articles, or on internet websites. These are so clear that I was shocked when I read the first one. I couldn't believe my eyes. But it didn't stop there. Soon I had four, then six, then eight, then ten clear references to a pre-tribulation rapture. Ephraim the Syrian proved to be a veritable gold mine. Now perhaps undiscovered is an overstatement, but the truth is these passages have certainly escaped notice in evangelical prophecy circles. I found these passages when I was reading through Ephraim's 150 plus Greek works which do not appear in the standard Church Father collections in English. Most in fact have never been translated into English. Now if these passages are as clear to others as they appear to me, this is explosive information. To be clear, I don't regard them as proof as of the pre-tribulation rapture, but they are a significant addition to the body of proof that the pre-tribulation rapture was alive and well in the early church. The pre-tribulation rapture is not a recent innovation, as many falsely claim. Now, there are two technical points you need to understand. First of all, the English translations are my own, and secondly, the location numbers are actually page numbers from their respective volumes in Frant Zolis' edition of Ephraim's Greek works. These page numbers are used as location numbers with several technical works, including the Thesaurus Linguae Graecae website, where you can find these passages in the original language. Well, let's look at these ten passages. The first is Sermon on Repentance and Judgment and the Separation of the Soul from the Body. And there we read, The signs and wonders which the Lord said had to happen, the famines, the earthquakes, the terrors, and the nations in upheaval. The report of these things does not disturb us, nor does the spectacle itself, for the elect shall be gathered prior to the tribulation, so they shall not see the confusion in the great tribulation that is coming upon the unrighteous world. Now notice that Ephraim includes divine judgments like famines and earthquakes under the heading of tribulation. This is significant. Like the early fathers in general, whether Greek, Latin, or Syriac, and whether pre-trib or post-trib, he uses the terms judgment, wrath, testing, and tribulation as synonyms when referring to the time of tribulation coming upon the world at the end of the age. The second reference is from on the fathers who have completed their course. And there we read, When we see the saints in glory flying off in light in the clouds of the air to meet Christ, the King of glory, but see ourselves in the great tribulation, who shall be able to bear that shame and terrible reproach? Now notice the contrast between the real believers and the hypocrites. The former go up and the latter go into the time of tribulation. This contrast appears regularly in Ephraim's writings. The third passage is from On the Second Coming of Our Lord Jesus Christ, and there we read, Indeed, the grace of God strengthens and rejoices the hearts of the righteous, and they shall be seized up in the clouds to meet him, while those who are lazy and timid like myself shall remain on the earth, trembling. Here again we see the real believers meeting the Lord in the clouds and the false professors going into the tribulation. The fourth passage is found in the Sermon on the Advent of the Lord and the End of the Age and the Coming of the Antichrist. There we read, For if anyone has tears and compunction, let him pray the Lord that he might be delivered from the tribulation which is about to come upon the earth, that he might not see it at all, nor the beast himself, nor even hear of its terrors, for there shall be famines, earthquakes, and diverse pestilences upon the earth. This merits two comments. First of all, Ephraim frequently gives us glimpses of his monastic misconception of what a real believer is. Thankfully, the principle of deliverance from the coming wrath hinges on the fact that we're a Christian, not on the fact of the fervency of our Christianity. Secondly, we see once again that Ephraim includes divine judgments like earthquakes and pestilences under the heading of tribulation. May we forever throw away the notion that tribulation and judgment are mutually exclusive. The fifth passage is found in On Patience and the Consummation of This Age and on the Second Coming. 
And there we read, Let us take up in our hearts the full armor, that we may be able to fight the good fight and tread down all the power of the enemy, that we might be delivered from the wrath coming upon the sons of disobedience. Now notice, we see here the same principle of real Christians versus empty professions, but this time it is couched in a dual blessing, victory in our walk now and deliverance at the rapture. This dual blessing occurs frequently in Ephraim. The sixth passage is found in 55 Beatitudes. Blessed is he who unceasingly remembers the fear of Gehenna and hastens to sincerely repent with tears and groans in the Lord, for he shall be delivered from the great tribulation. Once again we see the dual blessing. Real Christians will both live right now and be delivered from the great tribulation at the time of the rapture. The seventh passage is Sermon on the Resurrection of the Dead. There we read, Count us worthy Lord of the rapture of the righteous when they meet you, the master in the clouds, that we might not be tried by the bitter and inexorable judgment. Notice that here the rapture delivers believers from the time of judgment. In the fifth reference, the rapture delivers the church from the time of wrath. In the second reference, the rapture delivers the church from the time of great tribulation. Ephraim indisputably regarded wrath, judgment, and tribulation as synonyms. The eighth passage is found in the destruction of pride. Let us pray the Lord in great humility that he would take us out from the coming fear and count us worthy of the rapture when the righteous are raptured in the clouds to the air to meet the King of glory. Yet again we see his concern that many Christians are Christians in name only and not in reality, and that these shall miss the rapture and go into the time of tribulation. Note also that the coming tribulation is called the coming fear. Now we don't use fear in this way in English, but if you think coming horrors, the awkwardness will clear up. The ninth passage is found in how the soul ought to pray God with tears. There we read, Blessed are those who cry day and night that they should be delivered from the coming wrath. Once again, true Christians will be delivered. The last passage is found in On the Blessed and the Cursed. Blessed are those who cry day and night because they shall be delivered from the coming wrath. This passage is the same as the one above, except that this one is in the indicative in the Greek instead of in the subjunctive. So in conclusion, I have given you ten very clear statements of the pre-tribulation rapture from ten different works penned by Ephraim of Syria. These references should help to lay rest the fairy tale that the pre-tribulation rapture is a recent innovation. It isn't recent. It is as ancient as the New Testament. The pre-tribulation rapture was held by faithful men in the early church. And tragically, it was supplanted by the replacement theology of men like Augustine and Jerome. And replacement theology ruled the roost for centuries until the principle of the Reformation finally spread like wildfire in the field of eschatology or the field of prophecy in the 19th and 20th centuries. And now we come into the 21st century and replacement theology is foaming at the mouth like a rabid dog because pre-tribulation rapture theory or dispensationalism stands its ground and stands in the way of replacement theology. Replacement theology is incapable of in regaining its theological dominance. Folks, replacement theology is one of the most cunning perversions of truth in the church today. It undermines the literal interpretation of the scriptures. It undermines the Bible teaching on the church. It undermines the Bible teaching on Israel. It brings earthly economy into the heavenly church. If you want to examine these passages in fuller context or examine the original Greek or get information on my sources, please please refer to my post on this subject on my website, soothkeep.info. Look for the article, Ephraim the Syrian, 10 Undiscovered Pre-Tribulation Rapture Passages. I will include the link below. May the Lord bless all of you as you seek His will, His mind, and His heart in the prophetic scriptures.